Dr. Moshe Lad is a lecturer, a very active member of our academic Western Galilee College. He is an Arabist who specializes in the Arab-Israeli conflict. One of his books is entitled The Core Issues of the Israeli-Palestinian Dispute. Most recently, he published uh, another book by the name of O Stormy Country, Events That Agitated Israel, and we discussed it recently when there was the inauguration of the book. Uh, in which he describes and analyzes almost 40 major events that took place before and after the establishment of Israel. Moshe is also a reserve colonel at Israel Defense Forces, where he served 30 years, most of them in major capacities in the West Bank in Lebanon. Yep. Moshe, Bevakasha. Thank you. The floor is yours, and uh, you have uh, half an hour about <laughs> Okay. Um, Good afternoon. Thank you, Chaim, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I would like to uh, start and say that I'm really an Arabist, and most of my research is regarding the Palestinian society. Most of my documents and uh, knowledge is coming from the Palestinian society, not only, but most of it. For example, when I served as the governor of Jenin district, I had a very good chance to see people and meet people who were friends of Ezzedin al-Qassam at that time, it was in the 80s. And I was able to get from them, oh, uh, something which uh, I couldn't believe and I, I, didn't wrote, I didn't write about Ezzedin al-Qassam, but I contributed these papers and documents to others. But on the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that I will be able to add as for the uh, main issues of the Peel Committee, which is my, the Royal Commission, which is my presentation, but I would like to bring some more uh, information coming from the Palestinian side maybe, and to elaborate with some of those uh, inputs that I was able uh, to take. In any case, uh, the background of this uh, piece of story comes from 36 to 39, so-called the events, Meoraot in Hebrew, or the Big Arab Revolt. Um, just to be on the safe side, the, the two parties which started actually the Arab Revolt in uh, 36 came from the Palestinian camp. One was uh, the Husseinis, uh, headed by the Mufti, Haj Amin al-Husseini, and the others called the Majlisiyun, which is a uh, translation to Hebrew called, uh, I would say, uh, the counselors. They wanted the council, or they hold, they have hold the council, the, the Supreme uh, Arab Council. The others were the Nashashibis, the opponents or the oppositionists. The Nashashibis, the name Nashashibi probably came from somewhere in the Caucasus. I'm not sure about that. But they were also in Amman, and then after that they came to Jerusalem, and they were actually the opposition to the Husseinis. These two parties started so-called a fitna, uh, a war, a civil war between the two. And actually when we are summarizing the events or I would say the, what was called the, the Big Arab Revolt, we can say that there were more than 6,000 victims killed people from the Palestinian side, most of them in a clash between the two parties. And on the Jewish side, about 401 uh, victims, while British were killed about 11, I mean 114. In any case, whatever happened at that time brought the local government to call London, as you may know, and said, well, look, uh, we didn't came to this country to, to fight the British mandate. We came here in order to teach, to educate, to help the people get some idea how, as of how to run a state but we didn't come to, to fight here. And what is going on in the 
about five or six months, then the Peel Commission came in, was a war. No labor, no traffic, bad traffic, actually. A lot of clashes between Jews and Arabs. And by the way, the beginning, if you see here the picture of Abu Ghosh, there's a big, you know, uh, a big deal about who started the, the events, the big armor ball. As well as we all know, it started in Jaffa, okay? However, when you go to Abu Ghosh, and I was in Abu Ghosh several times, you hear from them, we were the first one to start, and they, they became so-called collaborators with the Jewish agency, and because of that, they started being the enemy, so-called the Palestinian Authority, beginning here in 1995. So it was a piece of history that uh, we will never know who started that. In any case, what is well known in uh, history is that uh, the whole re this revolt started in Jaffa. Uh, so what really happened while the event started about a few months later, um, those people from the British governor, government called, I'm sorry, called uh, London and said, well, we need somebody to come here and probably impose a deal or, uh, or break a deal or do whatever is needed just to have a partition between these two people which are fighting here. And uh, immediately after that, the Peel Commission called, actually the uh, formal name is the Royal Commission, known more as the Peel Committee. Uh, it came uh, here in this area. I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit about what they did here just in a moment, but I would like to say something. I think that the Peel Committee uh, conclusions are the master plan of the so-called the two-state, two, two, two people for two states, actually. Um, it, it, actually, it's a master plan. Then everybody took it as a the partition, even the Oslo Accord. And actually, one more point. We had, in all this long history of dispute, three opportunities or occasions that both parties were brought to a negotiation table. And there was a third party which started, which uh, tried to break a deal. It was here, in, this, in the Peel Committee. It was in the um, Partition Resolution 47, and of course, in the Oslo Accord. I had a chance to be the, during the Oslo Accord, the coordinator of <coughs> security with the Palestinian Authority, and actually we led the security issues there. And uh, we had to start and learn all of the stuff that worked at that time, because we were very much involved in the, the whole issue of uh, so-called the, the peace agreement, the uh, security attached and uh, the idea of how to run a peace through a security apparatus was very new at that time, and I was among those who tried to do that, and of course we failed uh, after uh, three years or so. So let's start and see what is all this uh, commission about. Um, so Haj Amin al Husseini, as we all know, started this revolt, and uh, he, 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 was, he was actually the, the one that the British mandate put into a framework and highlighted as the leader of the Palestinian uh, side. And in, in few occasions we heard that they wanted very much they wanted very much to arrest him then they tried to deport him, and at the end of the day, he just ran away without any kind of ability to, uh, to, to, point, to take him uh, to uh, jail. In any case, um, the Israeli Haganah was trying to kill him and, and ran after him to Gaza. He was also, he was also in Syria and Lebanon and so on. The Peel Commission arrived at that time, yes, I would like to be very precise with the dates, um, to uh, Jerusalem in, um, it was uh, in October, 
and uh, it started immediately the second day they started to work. The head of this commission, the Lord Peel, which has a, uh, an extraordinary uh, history that we will <coughs> no, I, won't, uh, I won't mention it now, he said we have to start immediately. And the second day after arriving to the Palace Hotel, which you, you see here in the picture, they were located there, they had a room, and they started hearing people, and by and large, uh, they had probably hundreds of people there. Um, actually, if we, they, they asked immediately, what were the reasons for the Arab revolt? They didn't know that. So uh, they were answered that from the High Commissioner, that uh, the Hajj, Amin al-Husseini, came in and went ahead and said, we would like to have two of our demands filled, fulfilled by the British government. First of all, stop the aliyah, stop the immigration of the Jewish people. Secondly, we would like to have a, to have a foot on the ground as a small, uh, let's say, council, a legislative council. And these two demands should be fulfilled. If not, and of course the High Commissioner Ask him, and if not, and if not, you'll see we're going to start a small revolt. And actually, it was a big revolt. So, um, Lord Peel called immediately. He wanted very much to see El Hajj, Hajj Amin, immediately as probably one of the uh, first people to testify in front of the committee. In any case, the region came into a total chaos at that time, and after a few months, Palestine didn't look like um, it looked before. And of course, this upset very much uh, the, um, the British. This hotel, by the way, just as an anecdote, but it's very important to mention that, um, was Palestinian. They uh, rented a few rooms in the hotel from the uh, Palestinians. And just for the record, in October 37, distinguished guests uh, were in this hotel. Adolf Eichmann and Herbert Hagen, hosted by the Grand Mufti at that time, and just to remind you that he wanted very much to have a concentration camp in Jenin. He wanted also to poison the water in Roshain, affect the affect uh, sources. And uh, why he went to this hotel, by the way, the hotel was built by two Jewish, Jewish uh, engineers, Ezra Dunya and Tuvia uh, Katinka. They were very much friends of uh, Haj um, Just as a concurrent to the uh, King David Hotel. The King David Hotel was known as a Jewish one, of course. So he wanted one that will be his Palestinian hotel. And this was actually the palace hotel. So the British, high, uh, the British Royal Commission, known as the Peel Committee, came to the region. And um, the starting day was November 11, starting day of their uh, hearings at this hotel. The Commission returned then to London in January 13, 1937, just to hear more people and try to get some input from the British uh, uh, government in London. And the Commission submitted its final report then when it came back on July 7, 1937. The Commission, uh, as I just said, uh, we have few pictures, more few pictures. Actually, I have at home more. I didn't have the time to, to show. I, I couldn't believe that I would have the time to show, but I have many, many pictures of uh, uh, this event. Here you can see the Lord Peel with one of the uh, members, Hammond Lurie, Laurie, which is called Luria by mistake. And uh, you can see also the, uh, the office of the Palestinian Royal Commission there at the side. Um, and uh, actually, they started hearing people in this uh, room. 
and the Commission started working, called upon many people in order to have a good idea about the situation. One of those dignitaries, of course, was uh, Chaim Weizmann, the first president of Israel, but at that time he was uh, so-called the one of the leaders of the Jewish the Zionist movement. He and Herzl are known very well as the political Zionists at that time. Here you can see another picture of Sir Maurice Carter and Sir Laurie Hammond exiting the Palace Hotel at that time. And this is the testimony of Heim, Dr. Heim Wesman. Um, Heim Wesman was asked many questions and uh, <coughs> actually you, know, you have the protocol, the minutes uh, of his testimony. And uh, just to say that uh, his testimony was very usual, no, nothing to, to uh, mention by the Lord Peel, nothing special was at that testimony. He was much more impressed from David Ben-Gurion. And I would say a few words about David Ben-Gurion. Wiseman was asked about financing, how the Zionist movement uh, uh, financed all this uh, land purchase. And he was uh, also, he asked Wiseman whether or not Jewish people forced Arab to uh, buy land. And uh, Chaim Weizmann, of course, said, no, we are always just buying. We are not enforcing people to sell, to sell um, land. And by the way, at that time in the Arab newspapers, uh, there was a, uh, going on uh, any, uh, a, a story that Jews are enforcing Arabs to sell land, which was, of course, a big lie, but it was done just in purpose because of the Lord and his people as a committee. So Heim Wedsman ended his uh, testimony in front, and then he had the two main leaders of the two parties. First of all, the first one was David Ben-Gurion. David Ben-Gurion, when, when he went to the, to the testimony, he was uh, instructed, I would say, or at least advised by Moshe Bellinson and said, argue and don't let him, uh, you know, have, uh, give the Arabs more land. I would like you to start to stay and be very tough with them. David Ben-Gurion said, let's see what will be there. I'm not sure that I know what I'm going to be asked. But first of all, um, he was the first one to come. Peel asked Ben-Gurion directly, you came from a distant land, from Poland, and you intend to take the place of the locals who have lived here for generation. Just to remind you, at that time, the proportion was 10 to uh, 1, about 80,000 people were at that time, um, who have lived here for generation. Do you have any document, a deed of sale, that gives you a right to this land? And then Lord Peel, in his mem memoir, in his memory, says, I remember that Ben-Gurion surprised me with his answer, he picked up the Bible and solemnly declared, this is our Kushan. Kushan, of course, in Turkish is the charter, um, and he especially used the name Kushan because Arabs will also understand that. I remember because he impressed us all with a true and a heartfelt statement. Um, actually, the testimony of Ben Gurion was very short. He didn't have to speak a lot. Uh, he really impressed him with what he said. He was running through a lot of uh, events in the history, starting with the American independence and actually the Jewish uh, ancestors and so on. Then came the Mufti. <coughs> and this is how he was described by Lord Peel. At the head of the Arab side was the Mufti, Hajj Amin al-Husseini. Although I am a considerate and restrained person, actually we have to mention that he was very ill at that time, 
uh, he suffered from a very unusual disease, and I don't want to get into details, and he didn't have the time, and, and he was not so uh, calm at the time when he was hearing Haj Amin talking. Because instead of talking about it, he began to grumble, the Katel, <laughs> and accused the Jews that they are capable of anything, and that we, the British do not fulfill the duty of guarding the holy places and the Zionists will desecrate them. This was just one of his uh, uh, points that he mentioned at that time. Then he mentioned a lot of uh, stuff happening all the time. He was asked why he started the whole, he said, I've, the whole uh, revolt, he said, me? Never. It just a spontaneous a spread out of uh, events that happened in, and it reminded me of somebody else that said that. In any case, Lord Peel asked him, who sold land to the Jews in Palestine, Eretz Israel? And Al Husseini answered, Arabs. In one case, the Sosuk family, by the way, a Lebanese family that was dominated, uh, dominating a lot of land. I can tell you one, again, one anecdote. When I was in Jenin in 1987, some people from the Sosok family came to, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was in, uh, during the, Le yeah, the Leban, the first Lebanon war it was in 84, I guess. Yes, but in, it came in, a, uh, when, when they opened the, uh, the gate for uh, Lebanese to come. And somebody came from, uh, from Beirut, very, you know, a car, very fancy car, and he was, he looked like, you know, somebody who is, really has some money, and he came to Jenin, and showed me a Kushan from that time, and he said, we came to redeem the land, and I said, to redeem the land, which land, he said, in Arabic, Marj Abu which was at that time, I said, well, some time has passed since then. You cannot have it now. And he was, he was sure that he will be. He said, Israel is a, is a country of, uh, you know, the, the law is dominating him. So we'll come and take the, the, the land. He said, he, he brought a Kushan that size, such big. So when they are talking here about selling land, I can understand what they are talking about. So uh, the Sosuk family, which one of them came at that time, sold 400,000 dunams. For those who are not really familiar, one dunam is, as you see here, the size of uh, 1,000 square meters. Lord Peel, <coughs> was there any sale by force? Again, he was very much interested to know that. And uh, Hosseini said, no, there was no sale by force. And then Lord Peel again, well, it means that there were only regular sales. And Al Husseini said, yes, the situation was that bad that he encouraged landowners to sell their lands. Lord Peel, do you believe that this country can absorb the 400,000 Jews who are now in the country? And Al Husseini said, no. And actually, this is what he said. He was asked time and again by uh, Lord Peel, uh, we think that we have to solve this problem by have a partition here and uh, have a two state, I mean, two, st uh, two people for two state. And he said, he used the word in Arabic, Abadan, which means never. And he said, what do you mean Abadan? What do you mean by never? And he said, well, uh, I mean that if we are going to go back now to the days of uh, uh, Jalal al-Din, and the days of the Arab Empire, Jews will have, and this is actually what made him very nervous, uh, Lord Peel, Jews will have to be second uh, stage citizens, and they will have to pay, I don't know, in English, I'm not sure, but in Arabic it's called jizya, which is, huh? Okay, had, uh, right, thanks, right, jizya. And he said to him, well, are you aware of the fact that we are now in the 20th century? And he said, yes, but we'll never let, we'll never let people 
any other than Arabs dominate this country. Then he started to grumble, as I just said, with uh, Lord Peel and Dope. He didn't have the time to hear him, and he was not so uh, happy to hear all this uh, stuff. So he ordered, just ordered, to have this gentleman out of this country immediately. Uh, the British government, the British government of the mandate started doing it. It took some time, but they were able to see him running by himself. <coughs> the commission traveled all over the country, as mentioned before. They had about 55 meetings in Jerusalem, two of which were public and the rest were secret. I guess this, you know all, all these ideas. Also in London, the commission held another nine secret meetings. To conclude this work, this report was published in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. By the way, they didn't want to publish it in Hebrew, and one of the agency members, Yalin, uh, said, well, if they are not going to publish it in Hebrew, we won't, we won't be able to understand what's written in. And they were then, they went ahead and published it, as you see here, in Hebrew. Um, it is a very unusual translation, you know. It's written here, which is <laughs> like, you know, a speech or a presentation, but it should be a, just a report. Um, okay, it contains about 300 pages with lots of detailed maps for the proposal for the division of land between Jews and Arabs, as you may know. Well, if I would like to make the conclusion about uh, what was going on for this about seven, six or seven month work, can, we can say that the mandate uh, from the committee, I mean from the committee conclusion, the mandate failed to bring peace to the region. And actually, I don't think that it was his mission to bring peace. They came as, a, as we understand, just to teach, to educate, to explain, to help the people, you know, get their statehood, but not more than that. In any case, um, they let the region, therefore, must they must be stopped. The division into two states will ensure each side its main goal, a secure life of freedom. This is what he believed, Lord Peel, he said it loud and clear at that time. Each side must realize its national aspirations. The establishment of the two states will remove the Arab fear, look at that, the Arab fear of Jewish takeover of the entire country. They were the majority at that time. People were on their way to Palestine from Europe, from other places, and they were afraid that the Jewish people will, with the money will take it over. <clears throat> of course, they also recommended to end the British mandate in Israel because of what was going on with the so-called the war, the revolt, and to establish two states in Israel, one Arab and one Jewish. In any, uh, just to see what were the, uh, what was the outcome. I guess that you'll agree that many of those numbers were just, just amorphic and fluid. I, I don't know. What I would say is that they proposed for the Arab state, the green area, of over 70% of the land. They proposed for the Jewish state about 17, in some places I found 18, in some places less than 20, nobody really, really knows exactly. However, it's not really mentioned. And of course, they proposed the so-called the mandated enclave in the middle in Jerusalem. I'll say a few words about that. Um, the ASTEP will include Judea, Samaria, and the Negev, the desert, as you see here. The territory of the Jewish state will include the coastal plain from Be'er Tuvia, inside where the end of the yellow part, 
and the Galilee, the Carmel Mountains, the Galilee, the Jezreel Valley, which is called Marj Ben Amr in Arabic, and the Beit She'an Valley, approximately about 17%. Now, <coughs> the British enclave, actually, this started the whole idea of so-called the international, international government in Jerusalem, or as it is called in um, the partition resolution, the corpus separatum. Jerusalem has to have a special case, corpus separatum. It started here. And when I asked several times for how long it's going to stay, many people say that it ended. I'm sorry, that it's still valid. One person said that it's just a matter of 10 years. You know who? Dori, uh, how about Dori, Professor Dori, it was the Gold. Gold, sorry, yeah, Dori Gold. That was the Ambassador. one of the eight. Yes, also he was aide of um, Bibi Netanyahu at the time. So he said, I don't know what his sources are. Uh, that ten years after ten years, it is just uh, a new a new story. Anyway, until today, we know that Jerusalem has uh, many, many issues when we are talking about the future of it. So this enclave, which is in brown <coughs> color, uh, had to have at that time 230,000 people. One third of them at that time should have been Jews and Arabs as well, and British, and it included Jerusalem, Bethlehem, the corridor uh, to Jaffa, Lod Airport, Sarafan, and Srifin Sarafan, as you may know. So this is about the uh, Royal Commission recommendation. And um, another thing that should be mentioned here is that during the transition period until the establishment of the state, the establishment of the national home will be frozen. Uh, when I, I'm thinking about just 10 years later, the partition resolution of November 29, uh, 1947, the proportion of land between Jews and Arab changed to 55 to 45. And the question is, why? Why are we so nice at that time? We had such a sympathetic attitude from the UN or something else. So many ideas can, came in on this issue. One of them were, was that in these 10 years, in these 10 years, a lot of things happened. First of all, the Holocaust, the picture from the Holocaust that made people change their mind about the size of the national home. And number two, uh, the idea of uh, Hajamin to help Hitler and contact him and go and have some 10,000 people from the Balkan um, being his soldiers, Hitler's soldiers. These two issues maybe brought the uh, committee at that time of, the, of the, uh, the UN to decide about the new sizes of the two states. Another point is for five years the Jewish immigration will be limited to 12,000 people per year. Now, <coughs> Lord Peel uh, reported his uh, uh, report to some of those uh, British uh, uh, houses. One of them was the Media, of course, and the Chatham House in London. And uh, of course, it was published and brought in many, many uh, media tools like BBC at that time. And uh, now about the reactions of the two, par the two parties. The Zionist Congress, 37, approved the negotiation, even appointed a special commission. Um, people were not satisfied. I think it was uh, 
Moshe Bellinson, who came to Ben Gurion and said, how come that you agreed to such a small size? And Ben Gurion in his memoir says, well, I didn't have a big uh, spiel, he said, way to play, but I was sure that the Arabs will refuse, and why not? I will be the good guy, let it be so. But I'm not sure that this is exactly what happened there. He didn't have a lot of uh, opportunities to, to reject it, so he had to say yes. In any case, the 20th Congress appointed a special committee, even though it was, uh, satisfied, it was not satisfied with the territorial plan, and they wanted to say just to the British, to sign to the British that we accept whatever you are asking for. Mapai of Ben-Gurion and Sharet, Moshe Sharet Shertov, and the general Zionist and Apoel Amizrahi and others supported. And they said there is no escape from partition even if they not accepted the new boundaries. Shabutinsky, the revisionist, and Tebenkin, Katz Nelson, and some others opposed the proposal. The members of Hashomer Tzair, which is for the days Mapam, advocated a single Arab Jewish state in the territories of Eretz Israel, Palestine, and nothing more. And uh, as you may see, this actually remained uh, the main, main uh, uh, points or main ideas or main notions during a lot of time. Even I would say a lot, uh, even today, you can find people who would say one state solution, Others would say, no, we had to have more. Others would say, well, we have to share uh, land with uh, Arabs. And uh, the reaction of the Arabs, it's very important to mention. Um, all Arab countries were negative. The coastal plain, the ports cannot be given up, they said. The Jewish settlement cannot be trusted because it's intentional. A lot of hostility and a lot of hatred was signed on this uh, newspaper at that time. Palestine, Eretz Israel is the country of all Arab. They didn't say Eretz Israel, I'm saying it. Uh, all Arab countries and their involvement is escapable. Then Palestine is also sacred to Christianity. They brought also the Christian in just to say, well, uh, they are also with us and we won't let it. And uh, well, they wanted very much to have a good uh, coalition uh, in, in front of the UN. It didn't help them. In any case, what happened after that is that the Peel Committee left two, I guess, two weeks or two months later, Peel died. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. He died about two months later. And as you may see, the big Arab revolt went on and on and continued uh, in the region, as you may understand, and it just ended in 1939. Just one more point. Do I have time? Five minutes? Yeah. Um, I, I spent some time with um, our, our counterparts, the Palestinian, as you may understand, in Oslo and after Oslo as a military man, as academic, and I, I have to say that whenever I brought this one, the Peel Committee, and they, they know some history, of course. They know even good history about the region. And I always said, well, we are now running after a solution, so-called, in Hebrew, which is two people, two states for two people. Why didn't you accept at that time? Here we go. We have two golden opportunities, one pill and the other one. Now, you want to, as a, some of them said, you want a formal or an informal uh, answer. What actually they said, at that time we felt very good. We were the majority. We had uh, the Hussein McMahon letters between 1915 to 1916. It's before the uh, declaration of Balfour, and we were more than you at that time. So why we were, uh, accept this? Okay. 
So and now, and now uh, no problem. We definitely accept Gaza and Jericho, of course, and we'll we'll go with that. Just to show you how history changed these issues here in many aspects. Thank you very much. Questions, remarks? Just one question about the map. Like, sometimes I don't get the logic of British maps because... You know it, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. When you look at, for instance, the Nazareth, what's the point of having it different part there, like instead of the closing part? It's supposed to be a Christian name. Yeah, that's why. Ma? That's a desktop, no? Another point is that that yellow part, part just in the south of Tel Aviv. Why did they put it? It's part of the Jewish state. Very intensively separate. This yellow part is He did my job fine. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's worth saying that they conducted over 65 meetings. Yeah. The committee. So they were uh, very much uh, viewed by uh, both sides. So they, this is something to, to, I mean, they did a very, very, uh, 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 very, uh, uh, I'd say, elaborative work. And, um, Second thing is about the uh, Mufti saying that he was not the one that uh, instigated the uh, revolt. Um, I think it's worth mentioning something about Rahib uh, al-Nashashibi. Uh, uh -huh. Rahib al-Nashashibi, yeah. yeah was, he was the leader of the Nashashibi. He was yeah. the leader of the Nashashibi. Uh, um, he was the mayor of Jerusalem. Council. Absolutely. And this is in some way, um, um, if, 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 I, uh, if I can look at uh, what happens in Germany in, in the 1930s, this is what von Pap a bit of what von Papen does with, uh, with, with, with the Nazi party. They think that, and the Shashibi thinks that they can give the Mufti the uh, um, uh, the seniority, yes. and he will fail, and then they can get rid of him, and and of course the Shashibi accept the Shashibis accept the, the P uh, commission. Yes, this is why they started to fight. Actually, uh, just to I, I mentioned the Majlis Siyun and the Moridun, which is the Hosseinis and Dan Shashibi. There was another party, the Istiklal, the uh, so-called the independence people of uh, Aoun Abdel Hadi, and actually. One said no Jews and uh, all the land to us. The other said uh, Nashashibi, we have to uh, make a petition with the Jews. The third one said independence now. So this is why they started the war between them. And I said 6,000 people, they killed each other. Just uh, when, when the, the enemy was the British, maybe the Jews, but not, uh, they didn't mention to have a fitna, which is a, a civil war. Yeah. Conceptually, the methodology of 37 and 47 are identical. Mm -hmm. The Peel World Commission based its statistics on the 1931 census, which had 1 million population, of which 750,000, or 70%, were Muslim, 150,000, or roughly 17, were Jewish. And the Jews at the time had come through from Haifa by ships and established kibbutzim in the north. So conceptually, what 47 did was the exact same. They looked methodologically at how many Jews and Muslims there were and where they lived. And the outcome was the exact same. Where you lived and were Jewish is where your state were, where you lived and were Muslim was where your state was, and 
Jerusalem would be the international city. And the same was the exact result by the Muslim response. We are the majority, we are the powerful, why should we accept any decision whereby the Jews, the minority and the weak, would actually be given anything because we can take it over? And the exact response afterwards, revolts and a war of independence. So 37 and 47 are virtually parallel where the one person who has grouped people, who has not learned anything, Sorry, it's in Hebrew, but I'll definitely the British, those yes, who, who the British can. British have not learned. There were three senses. Sorry, this one. Well, the there were yeah. three senses during the British mandate. Yes. I guess this is, uh, well, this is a, acceptable. So in thirty-one, they had a million, of course. Exactly. And this is the percentage of Jews here. And in forty. Well, the Arabs were seventy percent. They received seventy percent of the land. Yes. Jews were seventeen and received fifty percent. Yes. Yes. Eighty percent yes. yeah. were the Christians. Yes. Yeah, that, that was where Jerusalem came into the story. So that's understandable how the Jews got to that. And where were the Jews living? And the kibbutz around Jaffa. That's what they get. That's what they get. Yeah. And where they came from? Yeah. And when our forty-seven was identical methodology. So the British didn't start from history? They didn't learn the failure no, yeah. <laughs> to 47. You know what Churchill did in the parliament once? It's a famous joke. Uh -huh. He was asked, Mr. Prime Minister, can you promise us that Britain will not make uh, uh, the mistakes as it did before? He said, no, I can only promise we will make more mistakes, <laughs> new mistakes. That's Churchill. Yes. <laughs> uh, Any more? Just one comment. You mentioned that the peer report was issued in, in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. Hebrew. That's probably true that the Manchester government issued in those three languages. But I remember in my father's study, there was a heavy blue volume of the peer report in German. In German? In Maybe somebody. I, I, I have no idea. But I really have no idea, but I guess. I know about three languages. Maybe also in Spanish, I don't know. Maybe. No, it makes sense because the integration came partly from German, so it can't make sense that the English language didn't issue the German. Somebody grabbed it right for the British. Is there any difference between different translations or different versions? Like any difference between Hebrew and English versions? I can tell you from my experience with the Oslo Accord. I had Oslo Echo under my, you know, hand about three years in the Oslo Echo. Never trust translation. <laughs> never. It was written that Bethlehem is, you know, it's a place that everybody can go from Israel as well. As Kever Yosef, also tomb of Joseph. When you go to the Arab uh, translation, it was actually in, from English translated. It's written definitely. It's a whole area dominated by the Palestinian Authority. Nothing, you know, mentioned about, I don't know why, so when we had some problems, we went to the third party, which is, uh, of course, was America at that time, the United States, but never, never trust translators. They are not well, the doing cover, their job. The cover of the report is what you're actually asking. Because the cover in Hebrew said, Palestina, Eretz Israel. Eretz Israel. That is not in English. All of you, yes. yes. Say the original translation, something was said there. Okay, Todaraba Moshe. Thank you.